Okay, good morning. This is Tuesday, November 16. It's a class session of Math 261, Delta College, for Vector Calculus. And today we're gonna to open up our final chapter. This is the mission of calculus in general, the mission of vector calculus. Remember we said at the very, very beginning of the course, you've learned calculus backwards. Really, it was developed to solve problems in science and physics, in mathematics, about how objects moved and oriented, or interacted in three dimensions, particularly magnetic fields, gravitational fields, electric fields, motions of the planets. And now we've assembled all the tools we need to look at those questions. And the last thing we're gonna consider now is the vector field. Vector fields, it could represent the flow of water, it could represent the flow of electricity, of magnetism, of gravity flow in the appropriate sense, and how they contribute to motion in space. So that's the first topic here in chapter six. in a particular three special fields, special types of fields that he wants to draw your attention to, radial fields, rotational fields, and the most important of all, conservative fields. So we'll scan some fields quickly, but then we're gonna get right into how fields contribute to multiple integrals, how fields contribute to motion. And those are line integrals in section 6.2. that discuss the contribution of a function to a curve. Could be a curve in the plane or could be a curve in space. We're going to be open-minded about either one. Our first examples might be curves in the plane. And then once we understand how we can write an integral so that a function contributes to a curve, then we will say, what kind of functions should we examine contributions to a curve? And we'll talk about flow and the flux of field relative to a curve. So this is on the plate today. And then next time we're going to dive deeper into what conservative fields are and how we can recognize them. Conservative in the context of physical sciences where some quantity is being conserved it could be energy, it could be heat, it could be any kind of physical quantity that follows a conservation law. So after we describe how a field contributes to a curve, we want to know under what conditions we could simplify the calculation of a field contributing to a curve. And then these first couple sections lay the groundwork to then fields contributing to whole surfaces. What is the volume of wind that enters that window over time or the volume of field that spills through that surface over time or emanates from that solid over time? Okay, so vector fields and their contributions to integrals. Instead of integrating over an interval, a region, or solid, 
Now we want to extend this to integral over a curve or surface or a solid. Now, as you're getting ready to submit your second exam, I just want to remind you that exam two is due by 11.59 p.m. tonight. And that is Tuesday, November 2nd, uh, November 16, excuse me. So make sure you're finishing that up and submitting that on time tonight. In fact, if you can manage it, submit it maybe a little bit earlier than just at the last minute, just to make sure that nothing goes wrong. If you have questions about the exam, you can see me in my office hours today or send me a note through the day or into the evening. Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm usually teaching right up to four. And then I get to questions that people submit a little bit later in the afternoon or evening, but you can just try to submit a question if you have anything you're trying to wrap up there. Okay, let's move on to vector fields. So, and I'll share some Mathematica notebooks with you as we go. What is a vector field? A vector field is the last generalization of functions that we haven't considered yet. Remember, I broke down functions for you here. The input is a real number. Output is a real number. That's your first exposure to functions. But then the first thing we did in this class is extend it to a vector value. So you could have input still be a real number, but you could have the output be a vector in any number of dimensions you please. So this is a vector valued function of a real variable. Then we turn that around and said, well, what if we put in a vector, put in two or three coordinates and examined a single number? Like in three coordinates, what's the temperature at every point in this room? Or on the plane, what's the distance of this point from the origin? Those are examples of functions where the input is a vector and the output is a real number. Everything we could do with that, in this case, the one example I'm writing down right here would be a surface. Height is described as a function of position X and Y in the plane. Now we're gonna take the last step. And that is, what if you had an input of a vector and an output of a vector? What does that represent? We traditionally represent this like f of x and y is f of x, y, g of x, y. So vector in x and y, vector out, some function of x and y, some function of x and y in the first and then the second slot. Or if I put a three-dimensional vector in, I could ask for the output to be a three-dimensional vector. I'll give you a visual example here in a second. Now, the output can depend on x and y and z, and it can depend on x and y and z in any slot. So that makes this a little bit unwieldy to write. So sometimes people shorten these up to say the field is, has the component functions F and G, or the book is fond of saying component functions P and Q. That's just suppressing 
the display of the variables x and y or x and y and z. And that's okay as long as you know whether you're talking about two-dimensional or three-dimensional case. So I could do that by saying f, g, and h here f of x, y, and z is f of x, y, and z, comma g of x, y, and z, comma h of x, y, and z. Three-dimensional vector field. But in either case, what it means is that to every point, let's talk about two-dimensional field first. To every point in the plane, I'm assigning a vector. Oh. I want to add one more important type of vector field that we're going to discuss, direction fields. Another example of a useful vector field. So at this point, maybe one and two, I want to assign the vector that goes over two and up one. And that would be written like this, f of one comma two, is two comma one. And at every point in this plane, I'll likewise assign another vector. And this gives the impression of a flow. As I examine every point of the plane, and I'm not trying to draw any particular pattern here, but you can see the vectors can have different directions and the vectors can have different magnitudes. Every vector has direction and magnitude. So I'm assigning to every point on the plane a vector with direction and magnitude. You really, in this case, do you see I'm communicating a four dimensional experience, two dimensions in, two dimensions out. Now, I don't get something for nothing, right? So what I am doing, if I showed a vector at every single point on the plane, it would be awfully, awfully messy. So sometimes we just look at snapshots of a vector field, but they still can give us an idea of how things flow. Of course, in space, this is gonna get even messier if I consider that every point in space I can assign a vector of a different length and magnitude. Let me take you over to Mathematica and show you two examples of this. So you can do, and it turns out vector plots are very useful in many different courses, not just in ours, but let me share a Mathematica notebook with you. So first I wanna clear out my Mathematica. I'll move this over to here. And, and I posted a special notebook to help you with problems later as well. So I'll point that out to you when we reach that point to help you with the problems that you're gonna to do today or for your next homework and during the next few sessions. So let's set up, and then I'll make this an appropriate size in a second. Example of vector fields. And I'm gonna share this with you. Share screen, got it, got it, and go. So let me just define two functions, f of x underscore comma y underscore. This will be a function of two inputs equals and vector, let's say uh, x plus y, let's make it very simple to start with, and x minus y. And then let's define a function g of x. While we're here, we might as well set up a three-dimensional example. y underscore and z 
underscore. It's coloring things strangely, so I don't know why it's angry at me, but we're going to find out in a second. Notice how it's coloring the x, y, and z differently in the case of g and x here. So let's say this is, oh, x times y and sine of x. And uh, I don't want to get something too exotic that's going to be broken, but then let's say x plus y. Let's start simple here. So the command for plotting a vector field in Mathematica is vector plot. So I could simply say, let's plot the vector field F and let's do it over a small patch of the plane, X comma minus two to two. And then we'll copy that for Y. Just to see what I deliver. Okay, here's a vector field in Mathematica. Now, I have to be very careful because I expected this vector field to have arrows of different lengths at different positions. And so Mathematica has simplified things for me. So I need to make sure everybody understands how this has been simplified. For example, if I plug in one and one, I get a vector called two zero. Now I look over here at one and one, and I could have a vector that goes directly to the right, like two zero. But this is certainly not a vector of length one. So Mathematica makes some compromises in the description of this vector field here, telling you that it wants to communicate more of the direction that things flow instead of the total information of length and direction. Now, this is our first indication of something like what we call a direction field. A direction field is a field where every vector is a unit vector, a unit field, unit length field. And these vectors are not unit lengths, but they were made to be constant lengths so that I could examine how things flow. I do have this and that the arrows are also colored. So Mathematica didn't want to strip out the magnitude information. So it wants to tell me that the brighter colors have greater magnitudes. And I could display this with uh, probably plot label. I'm going to have to look this up. What is the correct thing on this? And, or I think I should say legends automatic. Okay. It's either plot label or plot legend, but if I fail here, I'm going to look this up in a second. It looks like I failed, so let's consult the documentation. Let's share the whole screen. And here we are. And let's look at the documentation for a vector plot. I had this automatically set up on another sheet, so I hadn't considered this. So I want to have something like this color coding that tells me what color represents different magnitudes. Plot legends equals automatic. So I was very close to it. Plot legends. So we don't want Mathematica to be drawing arrows that cross all over each other necessarily. So here, I have an idea that blue arrows are closer to zero magnitude and that the brighter orange or yellow arrows are closer to upwards of three to four magnitude. So keep this in mind that Mathematica is gonna make compromises when it displays vector fields so that 
you have clarity of what the fields represent. Let's do the same thing for G now. But G is a three-dimensional vector field. So I'm going to say vector plot 3D. And it was G of X, Y, and Z. And that means I'm going to have to add a Z component to my domain. And this is harder to deal with. I mean, it's beautiful. But do you see patterns here? Well, it's harder to take this apart one slice at a time. I could just take a plain slice of this and we'll give you an example of something like that later. But here's a swirling field in space. Oh, the airflow and weather patterns is a really good example of this. Or temperature gradients and weather patterns. This could be swirling air patterns in three-dimensional space. Is there any pattern to this? I, somehow these arrows are twisting and lining up in certain ways, but in three dimensions, it's very hard for me to visualize. So in three dimensions, I usually am restricting my attention to a particular curve or a particular surface or solid in space. And we'll give you examples of how to view that later. So I just wanted to give you an idea of how to visualize. Notice again, Mathematica is not drawing vectors by their length. It's coloring them by length and trying to keep all the vectors the same size for you to be able to see the patterns involved possibly a little bit easier. Oh, you, you can play with this and I'm gonna give you something specific to play with later. So let me back out of this. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and go back to my paper. And I'm gonna minimize this. So you have an idea of what a vector field is. Well, then what are some famous types of vector fields? I'll start at the bottom of my list at the opening of class because it's the one I've already done. A direction field. A direction field is a field that's meant to communicate direction. Usually you set all the vectors to a constant length. Or a special type could be a unit vector field. Then you set all the vectors to unit length. All the vectors to length one. And the reason for doing this is because this helps you study what we're gonna casually right now and formally soon call the flow of the field. Where is it going? Where is it accumulating? Where is it rotating? That tells you how the field is moving, water in a stream. Okay, other special type of field. Here's a radial field, very common in physics. For example, when we talk about gravity of a body, how a mass attracts by the force of gravity and I'm trying to draw a field that's going straight towards that point, directed towards the origin. And in a gravitational field, the field is directed towards the origin and the magnitude of that force of gravity is lesser 
as you continue outwards. Inverse square law. I'm not drawing this super sharp. But any field, a radial field, it could be an electric field from a positively charged particle. It's directed radially outwards and grows weaker as time goes by. It could be a radial field where I have all these vectors be the same length. It could be a radial field where the vectors have greater length as I go farther from the origin. Anything where the vectors point directly towards an origin. And I don't want to be, uh, I, I could say directly towards the origin or I said directly towards a single point. That single point could be translated elsewhere in the plane or in space. Another famous example is the rotational field. And I'll go back to my mathematic in a second. This is a field where the vectors are perpendicular. to displacement from the origin. In plain language, they're circling the origin or they're circling a single point. And when I say perpendicular to displacement from the origin, that means this vector is at a right angle to the vector that goes to that point. So this is say the vector field at that point dotted with the position vector to that point is zero. Okay, I'll show you a picture of a rotational field here because it was in the Mathematica documentation that we had just open a second ago. Here's a simple rotational field. All of these vectors are perpendicular to the vector that comes out of the origin to meet them. This field here is not called rotational, but it has a type of rotating to it. Uh, first of all, notice that they wanted to jazz up the arrows, so they turn them into droplets, vector markers, drops. Okay, this looks cute. You sense a kind of a rotating here, but still the vectors are not perpendicular to displacement from the origin. So this is a field that's tending to rotate. It's not fully rotational, but maybe we can use that property of the field. Just looking at some other interesting Fields here, vector points, vector. You can go through the documentation on vector field to see all kinds of useful ways to draw things. Here's a vector field where I'm sampling the flow randomly. And it looks like a kind of an interesting flow right here. A very common application of vector fields and vector flows is in solving differential equations. So some of these things that represent here may represent systems or higher order differential equations, which you can learn about in another class. I'm gonna stop sharing this with you, but cut into the documentation for vector plot and vector plot 3D if you want to see some of the ways you can decorate, color, arrange or otherwise represent arrows and vector fields. Okay, one more really, really important field is a conservative field. Or 
or sometimes called a gradient field. Do you remember your old friend, the gradient? If f of x and y is, I don't know, x squared y cosine xy, this is a function of two variables. But its gradient is properly a field. And a gradient field has some unique properties that are valuable in physical sciences. So let me write this and maybe I'll take it and draw it. So partial F partial X. Now, i be really careful. I'm gonna do my derivatives correctly, but I have two functions of X and two functions of Y right here multiplied together. So partial F partial X. First times the derivative of the second, which would be minus with respect to X, a minus and a y come out. So I have minus x squared, y squared, sine xy, not x comma y, x times y. And then I have to say plus second times the derivative of the first with respect to x is 2xy cosine xy. Good. And then I have Second slot, partial derivative of f with respect to y. Well, it's first times derivative of the second, which would be a minus x come out. So this would be minus, no, sorry, just a comma, minus x cubed y sine xy. And then second times derivative of the first, with respect to y plus x squared cosine xy. So that naturally creates a field. And this looks like a really messy field right here. I'm kind of curious what it looks like. Let's take it over to a Mathematica notebook. So I'm going to come back here and share screen just in case I have to pop into documentation. But I don't mind sharing screen. And let's create a new Mathematica notebook. And let's make this Mathematica notebook a little bit larger size. And say f of x comma y. Let's define a function by reserving the variables x and y and saying x raised to the 2 times y times cosine, capital cosine, square brackets, x space y to denote multiplication. Remember, not x, y, because that's a name of a variable. OK, so we take this. And then we can take the gradient just by saying, what's the derivative of f of x, y, comma, with respect to x. So this is what we wrote down here, 2xy, just double checking our work, right? But we did write that correctly. What's the derivative with respect to y? And let's put this in braces so it looks like a vector. And let's plot this object and make sure I copied it correctly. My goodness, we actually did the derivatives correctly. So let's do a vector plot of this just to see if the field looks interesting or remarkable. Vector plot, and let's plot it over x comma minus 2 to 2. There's nothing magical about the window I'm choosing right here. y comma minus 2 to 2. Now, there's no reason why a vector field should be defined at every point, but this function and this gradient is defined at every point of the plane. So I'm just taking a snapshot of a window around the origin. And how do I want to represent this? Uh, it's a little bit awkward to define functions and then drag them into plots. 
So where I could say vector plot of f, if this was directly a function, this differentiation is a command. So what I think I'm going to do is take this output right here and let's give it a name and let's call it just casually gradient f, which is a function of x and y. So this, let's see if I'm get allowed to do this. There we go. Let's see how Mathematic accepts that I'm defining a new function called grad f, just as a shorthand for gradient. And then I'll take grad f of x and y, and I'll do the vector plot. I just didn't want to copy and paste that whole mess. Okay, execute. And we got zip. Oh, because I didn't execute grad f yet. Sorry. Well, that's beautiful. I mean, I could make all kinds of interesting patterns in such a way. Notice on the y-axis, it's almost like the motion is or only horizontal, that on the y-axis, that when x is equal to zero, the y component is also zero. I could go and check the y component right here. When x is equal to zero, certainly the y component of this vector is equal to zero. Now, when y is equal to zero, which is the x-axis, notice how there's no horizontal component. So I go and check my thing. Yes, when y is equal to zero, there's no horizontal component. In fact, when x is equal to zero, there's no horizontal component, as if there is no vector field there. But there is a vector field when x is equal to zero. Well, I could probably discover many interesting patterns about this vector field, but a gradient vector field, I'll go back to my paper, usually is the way we choose to describe a conservative field. Now we're not ready to tell you the full power of conservative fields yet, but they are particularly valuable to us. So a conservative field is the gradient field of a given function. It has to be created by a function and the gradient. But if I just hand you a field and tell you it's conservative, you might not know the function that created it. And that's the trick, how to find the function that created it and how to recognize gradient fields. How do, or conservative fields. How do I recognize conservative fields? And how do I identify the special function f that created a gradient or conservative field? And that special function is called the potential function. So when you have a conservative field, you always have a function that gave birth to it. It's called the potential function, this lowercase f right here. You could use the notation f field is the gradient of little f, the potential function. So this is a very important concept and it's not trivial. Say, so how do you tell when a generic field you've been handed is a conservative field if you haven't been told this f and if you haven't been told this f how do you identify it this is the subject of section 63 okay but we're just going to play around with some examples of fields today okay so i'm numbering the papers and this is as much as he's presented in section 1 I want to move on and give you examples of line integrals and show you how to compute some things, give you some nice example and a worksheet to help you with your homework. 
Let me organize my papers so I can reach over here. So, how can a field contribute to a path or a surface or a solid? So remember formerly how we described a definite integral. So I'm laying the groundwork for what we're going to do now. And I want you to remember this phrase. It's not the be all and end all but it's a good physical description of definite integrals. A definite integral is a length, an area, or a volume or the contribution of a function there too. How do we understand this if we want to have new and exciting functions contributing? So what this meant is I have a function contributing to an interval. Now I didn't write that as interval i from a to b, but I certainly could. Or I had a function double integral contributing to a region or an area R. Or had a triple integral of a function contributing to a volume or a solid G. But now, We want to add a couple of other possibilities. A couple of other formats. Let's talk about a function contributing to a curve or a path. Remember, we were very successful describing curves in the plane or in space. Let's say here's a curve in the plane. C described by R parameterized by T x of t and y of t. Or in space, be a little bit more complicated. C described by a function r for parameter t. It describes the position of something at every moment in time and space, x of t, y of t, z of t. Remember that we had an orientation. That was the interval over which the curve was defined. And we did all sorts of calculations on this curve. Uh, to make my drawing a little bit better, let me name the axes. Let me name the axes here. And let me emphasize 
the starting and finishing points here. So I draw two pictures here just to make sure that you're not prejudiced against two dimensional or three dimensional paths. In fact, we could have a path in four dimensions or five dimensions or more, right? But that's not what we're doing right now, but we're, we're strictly saying two and three dimensions in our work. Let me adjust something right here, just so I know what we're seeing. Okay, good. But now, what would it mean? Let's call this curve C. In both cases, I call this curve C. So what I'm going to write down now is not dimension specific. But what would it mean for a function to contribute to the curve C? Not an interval, not a region, not a solid, but a curve. And how would I count the contribution of the curve? Well, I, the first basic thing I know about any curve is its length. I can cut up any curve, two, three, or more dimension, into little length pieces. So let these little DSs be little bits of length, right? And I remind you that DS was a little bit of length in the sense of a little bit of X and a little bit of Y. So DS could be the square root of DX squared plus DY squared, casually, just Pythagorean theorem wise. Or same thing over here, but I don't want to crowd my picture. ds could be the square root of dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. Uh, I think for the sake of completeness, I am going to crowd my picture. Remember, you can have these notes downloaded. dx squared plus dy squared. And that might be a little bit easier to read than you can read on the camera right now. So I'm going to add up the contributions of f to the curve c along every little piece ds. I chop the curve, two or three dimensions, into little ds pieces. And then I check the value of f at each little ds piece. And then I add that up over the entire length of the curve. If f is a density function, and ds is a little piece of length, this adding up could be the mass of this wire in space or otherwise. If f is a function that represents temperature, then maybe I could use this to find the average temperature of this wire or the temperature distribution across these wires. But this is an idea. This is a thought. How do I make it something that I calculate or compute. Well, now I have to expand what I mean by ds right here. So remember, now we have to define this. Remember that if r of t is, let's just do the two-dimensional case just to warm up, x of t and y of t, then I could write dr dt is dx dt and dy dt. I'm using Leibniz's notation of differentials right now. I could say r prime equals x prime comma y prime if you prefer that, but I'd like to describe the, I'd like to display the independent variable. And this was called speed. Well, excuse me, it's called velocity. The magnitude of it is called speed. Let's look at the magnitude of it. That is the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared. But now this is 
kind of perilously close to dx squared plus dy squared square rooted. In fact, what would happen if I multiplied speed, magnitude of velocity, times dt? So I put a dt on the outside here. Outside the square root, slip it inside the square root, it becomes dt squared. So when I multiply that out, I get the dx quantity squared, a little bit of x squared plus a little bit of y squared. And that is what I call ds. Now remember, I also spoke like this when I was doing curve integrals. Didn't I say the length is the integral over c of ds, chop c into little s pieces, chop c into little length pieces and add up all little length pieces? Didn't we also say there that ds dt was speed, the rate of change of distance with respect to time is speed, and the rate of change of position with respect to time is velocity. So this is very cool. This is completely consistent with everything we did previously. So here's how we define the contribution of f to c. We will integrate over where c starts to where c stops. We will check out the value of f at every little position on the curve. And the ds is the magnitude of velocity times dt. Now, velocity, remember, is r prime. So whether you write this as magnitude r prime dt or magnitude velocity dt, I don't mind. As a first step, I'm just going to write it as magnitude of velocity dt. So now I've defined the contribution of a function to a path. And notice this has nothing to do with two or three dimensions. This could work for either one of these pictures. So this is a very general and universal thing. Okay, now we're gonna extend this as we go along, but let's first do some example of what contribution of function to path might mean. Now, as it happens, this might be a natural place to take a break before I actually do the first example and pull out a Mathematica notebook. So let me say, let's come back at checking the time here, 901. And then, I'll do a physical example of a contribution to a function to a path, and I will give you a visual interpretation of what that could represent. I'm gonna mute my microphone and stretch my legs for a second, and you're welcome to do the same. I'm just cleaning up my desktop here for a second, but I'll see you in a few minutes.
Okay, back to work. Uh, you also might be wondering why is my other camera pointed at my chair right now? It's not so much that we can point at the whiteboard if we wanted to, but I want to make sure I have a monitor right now showing me exactly what you're seeing. So that monitor is like join the meeting. That monitor enabled Dave's whiteboard is join the meeting so that I see exactly what you're seeing because it's the visuals on seeing vector fields and interpreting them. They're not always obvious. So I want to make sure I was displaying what I wanted to display. So let's do a simple example of a function contributing to a curve in the plane. And what I want to do, I want to show you where you're going to find, I'm going to open up a Mathematica notebook that's been pre-filled in in a second. And this notebook is on our website and available to you because I think you're going to use it when you do your homework problem, or you might find good use for it when you do your homework problem. So let me just point it out to you, show you where it is on my website. So we're looking at the website. We're here in week 12. Remember, I number the weeks from one to 16 because we have two half weeks. Uh, I could imagine that based on things people say in other classes that might be different than some the number someone calls the week they're in. But if you just stick to our schedule, that's fine, not confusing. I do want to point out that you have very few weeks left in the semester here. So we are doing our final unit right now. Also point out that next week, I think you deserve a break. You're going to get that Thanksgiving break. On Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, Delta College has no courses or you know office hours, things like that. You can still contact me by email. But our only session next week is on Tuesday. So anyway, under week 12, under technology, I'm looking at this Mathematica notebook called 261 Exercise 6280 Alt Demo, because I've assigned you a particular Exercise 6280 Alt. And this notebook might help you uh, construct visuals for that problem. Although the things I have preloaded into it are not from that problem, you'd have to adjust them. So I'll open up that notebook in a second. I just wanted to point out to you where it was. It is a Mathematica notebook. I don't know why I didn't label it .nb, but I can address that later. Okay, so let's look at this example. Let's go back to the paper before we pull up the Mathematica notebook, show you the visuals. Let's just do a very basic example of a function. And the function will be xy plus x squared, nothing exotic. And a curve, also not exotic. But sines and cosines are fun. We'll say cosine t sine t. And a specific interval, remember curve has to have a domain and we're gonna look from just zero to pi. So what would it mean to calculate the integral of f ds for this curve c? Okay, so we're gonna use our formal definition. We go from zero to pi of the function evaluated at each point of the curve. In other words, I just stick in x equals cosine t, y equals sine t into the function. And then the ds is the magnitude of the velocity dt. So I've got to assemble pieces and insert them into here. So the first thing I have to do is calculate the velocity, which is minus sine t and cosine t. And then I have to calculate the magnitude of the velocity, which is the sum of the square roots of the squares of the components. But this will just be sine squared t. I'm saying minus sine t times minus sine t is sine squared t plus cosine squared t. And this is one. You 
understand that anytime you have a square root, you could have things that don't resolve themselves under the square root. So remember, this is our first example. It turns out to be a mellow square root right here, a very famous and mellow square root. Sine squared plus cosine squared is one always when you have the same argument. So really our ds in this problem, which is mag v dt, it's just one dt or dt. Okay, and uh, you would recognize this as what we called an arc length parameterization early in the course. So now let's set up our integral. So this was just a little bit of an aside. So let's plug in cosine t and sine t to this function. So what I get is the integral from zero to pi of cos t times sine t. plus cos squared t and times one dt. And you know, the one is here, the one is multiplying each one of these, but that doesn't make this a uh, very messy expression. I, just, I didn't need to write that one. I just want to make sure you saw it. I just want to make sure you saw the mag v sitting right there. Okay, so now let's integrate this, but Let's integrate it in an intelligent fashion. In other words, I could integrate this by saying, where does cos t sine t come from? It comes from one half sine squared t by, you know, chain rule. But I also want to think about this physically, right? So I remind you of two famous trig identities. The two sine t cos t is actually the sine of the double angle, 2t. And also the cos squared t can be replaced with can be replaced with one half plus one half cosine 2t. So this is one of the identities of a double angle. And you could look these up or I could remind you about how to construct them. Uh, the other famous one we use often is sine squared is half minus half cosine 2t. So the double angle formulas are kind of useful. And the cosine squared and sine squared are very much the same, except sine squared gets a minus sign. So I always remember that by saying sinus minus. And that's silly, but if it sticks in your brain, that's useful. So what I have here is one half sine 2t. Okay. And what I have here is one half plus one half cosine two t with respect to t. But the reason I took care to do that is because the sine of two t, I'm not gonna draw a sine wave excellently, sine of two t is a period of pi. So the net area under sine two t from zero to pi is zero. And half of zero is still zero. And likewise for this, the cosine of 2t, eh, I'm not drawing very smoothly today, am I? It's also a single cosine wave that's got a period of pi. So symmetry says this is zero. So when I'm done with this, I get pi over two, just one half times zero to pi dt. So, I don't mind if you evaluate this by the book, antiderivative, stuff like that. But first, you think of integrals geometrically. First, you think of integrals as areas, lengths, volumes, or contribution of the functions thereto. But now I want to visualize this. So in what way could I visualize the contribution of this function to this curve? I know what this curve represents. This curve represents a half of a circle in the plane, xy plane, and that circle is being described counterclockwise right now, right? From zero to pi. And I suppose I could graph this surface if I wanted to graph this surface. Notice it is a surface. But instead of graphing the surface over the whole xy plane, 
I think I just want to graph the surface over that curve. Now, I don't think I can draw this very well by myself, but I will appeal to the computer in a second. So let's just say what we're going for. We're going for a half circle with positive Y value. So I'm going for something that might look like this. Yeah. Harder to draw in perspective. From one to minus one. And then I'm going to let Z be the height of that function over that curve. So this is not a true drawing that I'm about to execute. But let's say it goes like this. And what I have here is like a curtain. Huh, my energy saving device is about to turn off the lights. Let me see if I can wave my hands and avoid this. And it's legitimate to ask for the area of that curtain, at least in this two-dimensional example. What's the area of that curtain? Think of that as a funny shower curtain. And you want to know what the area of that curtain is. And that's very much like your interpretation of the integral of f dx from a to b. Isn't that how you thought of the area from a to b under a function? Well, this is just a flat shower curtain. So here's a curtain in space. Let's draw this and see if we can see pi over two. Now, I can barely pronounce pi over two, you know, 1.57 and stuff. Am I gonna see it? I don't honestly know, but let's take a shot at seeing it. And you'll also see once I do that, that this picture is insufficient. This picture is not accurate. So I make sure everybody understands that in case you check these notes later. Not a picture of our problem. See the Mathematica notebook. Just make sure everybody's on the same page. 261.exercise.06. Dot zero two dot eighty alt. Okay, so I'm going to open this notebook up in front of you and share it with you if I can find it. And we're over here. This is why I want to make sure I'm seeing exactly what you're seeing. And the next thing I'm going to do is make the writing a little bit larger, if that helps, doesn't hurt. Okay, so here's what I got. I have a function called x times y plus x squared, a function of x and y, and I have a curve called r of t is cosine t and sine t. Uh, in a second, I'm gonna look at the gradient of this function too, but so I'm just defining these things that I'm about to use. Now, how should I draw the curve in the plane. Remember, I want to create a three-dimensional example, but my curve is in the plane. I'll just draw cosine t and sine t with zero height. I'll pick a time interval from zero to pi. That's what I was instructed to do. And I do have to pick an intelligent plot range. So I thought about where I want this picture to be displayed. So I took some adjustment right here, but I'm going to make this curve in the plane black. And uh, I don't want to do any more than show this curve in the plane right here. So I'm going to comment out, excuse me. I'm going to come out, out some of this unnecessary stuff. So here's the curve in the plane. It's just that half circle, but I'm displaying that half circle in space at height zero. I can't. I mean, you can see that it's kind of at height zero. And from above, you can see that it's kind of a half circle. 
I did take care to put in the box ratios that match the box I was using so that this looks like a circle. Okay, so step number one, I can draw the circle in space. Let's look at step number two. Then, and then let's put this back to suppress display until I want to bring them together. Let's draw the function over the curve. Now that's gonna look exactly like what I just did, except I'm gonna add a third slot. And the third slot is gonna be the function, but not evaluated at generic X and Y points, evaluated only at points along the curve, which is X equals cosine T, Y equals sine T. Same plot range. And I'm gonna make this one blue. And I think I'm ready to pump this into the show command. So let's put those two together. There's the curve on top of my circle. And from above, it's harder to see this in perspective, but this curve is on top of that circle, but some parts of this curve are nearer to you so that you see that I'm not exactly on top. I can change that by saying more viewpoint. No, that's not what I wanted. Excuse me. Let's try it again. More viewpoint. And then I'll pick above orthographic. Oh, and you're not seeing this because you're not seeing pop up windows. Let me change this to share screen. Okay. I might get out of the share screen in a second to make things larger to do. But after I executed this command, I can choose other ways to decorate this more viewpoint above orthographic. Then you see that this is on top of that circle exactly. Notice some of the circles blue and some of it is black. And then we go back to the original picture and I'm gonna go back to just sharing the worksheet. And you notice that some of this wire is above the half circle and some of this wire is below the half circle. So remember, I want to find the area of the shower curtain here. So now let's draw the shower curtain. Let's visualize the shower curtain. So I want to take the curtain, which is gonna be the same plot, cosine t, sine t, but I'm going to let the H vary. So this will be a surface now. T zero to pi describes how the curtain is drawn. H zero to height function of sine and cosine, function of cosine T sine T, that'll be the top of the curtain and zero will be the bottom of the curtain. But you see some of the part of the curtain pokes below that zero level. So now let's add the curtain. And this is the visual I'm trying to create. Now, is that shower curtain area exactly pi over two? Well, you know, I could do things like add up these boxes and see if it's about that. I could do a closer examination of this picture. You know, the area of that shower curtain is not really pi over two unless I call it net area because I have this area underneath contributing or detracting from the net area. So remember, there's always this concept of net area you got to understand or incorporate into your solutions. But this is one way to show what the contribution of a function to a curve might look like. Now notice this could be the blue thing could represent the temperature of that black curve. It could represent density, but I don't want to have negative density unless we've the physicists have discovered a new material. So uh, be careful about your interpretations when you assign mass or density to something. You don't naturally want mass or density to ever be negative, but you could have temperature be negative. Okay, let's go back to the paper. And let's do another contribution. So now 
And I want to describe this in English for a particular reason. Now that I know how to measure the contribution of a function to a curve, The next natural question is, what kinds of functions should I look at? What kinds of functions should I measure the contributions of. And this is where our field interest comes into play naturally. Let's just draw a two-dimensional picture here because our first example is gonna be two-dimensional, but we eventually have to bring this into three dimensions. Let's let me describe it as a simple and general curve here. R of t equals x of t, y of t, t is from a to b. And now let's imagine that this curve is in the presence of a field. Let's say the field, I'll draw the field in blue, shows up better on the paper than it does on the camera and the field's components, I'm gonna make no commitments. I'll just call them generically F and G. So I'm not describing any particular case right now, but we'll go back to the example we just did. So I don't want to draw a thousand field arrows here. I don't even wanna draw a hundred or 50, but let's say a field is flowing through this plane, but I can draw, let's just examine the field on the curve field arrow, field arrow, field arrow, maybe even backwards, field arrow. So these are field arrows being measured or observed along the path. This path in red could be, and remember the path in red has an orientation, the moment I say beginning point and ending point. So I'm going a certain direction on this path and I'm observing, let's say the blue represents the wind at my back. Let's say that this is a puddle in the XY plane and the blue represents the way the water is spilling across the plane. So let's say that this force has a physical interpretation now I wanna do a super zoom on a part of this window. So I'm gonna just take this one little section right here where I'm looking at the curve and a field arrow at that point. And I wanna blow this up. So allow me to slide the paper over, super zoom. And let's look at this curve coming through that window. And let's look at this arrow. Being observed at that moment. Now remember we had all kinds of tools for describing my path through space, unit tangent, unit normal, etc. So let's say that I describe the unit tangent vector. And I don't tell you how long this F is, right? So my unit tangent vector, that has to be one unit long, but that's just gonna be as I describe it. Let's say that that's one unit long. Let's say that that represents the unit tangent vector. You know what I'm kind of interested in is 
some parts of this blue arrow, remember, I could decompose this blue arrow into the part along T and the part perpendicular to T. Some parts of that blue arrow are along T. Some component of that field is moving with me or maybe sometimes otherwise against me. And that's called the flow of the field along the curve. But how do we represent that? Remember how we calculate the magnitude of that vector right there. That is f dot t. Remember, because the magnitude of f dot t is what? Mag f, mag t, cosine of the angle between f and t. But since mag t is one, this is mag f, cosine theta, which is this component. Mag f cosine theta is the length of this leg of the right triangle. So f dot t is a part of the field that's flowing with my path C. Now, if I want to add up all of the field that flows with me from A equals T equals A to T equals B, I could consider this to be my function in the F dot DS. I could say, instead of C F dot DS, let's make this F, Remember my question, now that I know how to measure the contribution of a function to a curve, what kinds of functions should I measure the contributions of? Let's talk about the flow contribution. This will be f dot t ds. Now remember, this was an idea, integral over c of f ds. So I need to understand this idea. I need to know how to plug in the curve to that. And that's why we'll do an example in a second. But this is called flow. The flow of the field along a curve. <coughs> if all the contributions end up going more along the curve than against the curve, you can see the flow would tend to be positive. But if enough of the field is going against me, or the field's going against me in a particularly powerful way at a certain point, I could have the flow be negative. I could have the net contribution as the field is fighting me as I go along this curve. Okay, so we'll do this example in a second. But now likewise, remember I have a unit normal vector. I'm going to have to be a little more careful when I talk about this, but we remember the unit normal vector that we used before. If f dot t is this component of the triangle, then actually this component of the triangle, positive or negative, and as I drew it here, it would be negative, you can calculate is f dot n. And this would be measuring what portion of the field is crossing the path, crossing the railroad tracks, water spilling across the railroad tracks left or right. Well, left or right will depend on the orientation I set for N. So in that case, if I made this my function that I measure, along C, then this integral, C of f dot ds, written C f dot n ds, this is called flux. 
flux. Flux is the amount of the field spilling across the path or not moving along the path. So this field arrow has a natural piece that's moving perpendicular to the path. It'd be smarter to draw it over here, wouldn't it? Because I'm seeing this happen at this point. And it has a natural piece that's going along the path. They're f dot n and f dot t. Flow could be the flow of electricity in a wire. Flux could be the water spilling through a dam. Now the problem is in the plane, if I have a line drawn on a tabletop and then I pour a bottle of water out, I could measure the water spilling across the line I draw on the tabletop. But more interesting applications would be volume of water flowing through a pipe across the dam, air blowing through a window or a sail on a sailboat. So this expression I think is interesting in two dimensions, but it's gonna be more interesting in three dimensions. I do want to say so far that this discussion is two dimensional. Remember, because I was talking about a curve in the plane and the field contributing to that curve or perpendicularly oriented across the curve. So this is a two dimensional example. These are two dimensional examples. But let me calculate one of these just to see how they work. So you say, what field are you gonna use? I say, why don't we use the gradient field of this function? You know, just because we already started contributing, calculating with this function right here. Remember, every function creates a natural gradient field. And here the natural gradient field of partial f partial x would be y plus 2x. And here partial f partial y would be x. It's not a crazy or exciting field, but why don't we use this as our field to do a calculation? And then why don't we illustrate that visually in Mathematica? So let's do that. Let's calculate the flow of f of xy equal the gradient of xy where f is this function we had prepared before, along the curve C, just a simple half circle, cosine t, sine t. So I want to calculate f dot t ds over c. Now remember, this is a representation. It's an idea. Now, how do I calculate it? I also have to know what the field is. And we already calculated this a second ago. y plus 2x and x. So how do I calculate this? Well, I have to examine what T is. Remember T was V over mag V. That was the unit tangent vector that was relatively easy to describe. And remember DS conveniently is mag V DT. So actually T times DS, the mag V's cancel out and T times DS is cancel the mag v's v of t dt. I also want to represent that in another fashion, right? So I want to just show you other ways people write this. Notice that v is dr dt, the rate of change of position with respect to time. And dr dt times dt, we can naturally call 
dr. So this actually gives us another way to write this integral. And it's a famous way to write this integral. This, apart from being called flow, people might represent this as, from their physics class, work. Let me go back to my previous picture right here. Do you remember a famous example of you dragging a suitcase across the floor? You're pulling in this direction, and the suitcase is right here and you're dragging the suitcase across the floor. And you might be pulling with a certain amount of force, but really the only force that's moving that suitcase horizontally is that component of the force in the direction of motion. So in the very beginning, you represented force, uh, work as force times distance. But in the vector language, it might be more logical to call it force dot displacement. Now this is fine if the displacement vector is a certain length and the force vector is constant over that displacement, right? You know, 10 Newtons for 12 meters, I dragged that suitcase. But now let's look at it in this context. What if the force I'm applying is I swing the suitcase around in the air as all good baggage handlers do? Uh, you know, I'm swinging the suitcase left, right. You know, in the very, very old days, there was a Samsonite luggage commercial where they just handed this piece of luggage to this very beautiful, large gorilla. And the gorilla was just throwing that suitcase all over the place. What kind of work was the gorilla doing on that suitcase? So anyway, I could be applying the force. The force could be varying. My path might not be a straight line. But the concept is still the same. Force dotted by displacement is work. And if the force and displacement are changing with respect to position, all I have to do is take up all the little work pieces I make by summing the force dotted with the displacement. And that's work in any context. So one interpretation of flow could be work, but now this gives me a way to evaluate this. So I know I go from A to B, F of R of T, one way to evaluate this, dr. Okay, so now this is how we actually evaluate it. Let's do it for our problem. So our problem went from zero to pi. And the F was Y plus two X comma X. I don't like to write like this because I got to substitute in the R, right? I'm just telling you what F was. And then we're gonna put in the R in a second. And what's the DR? Remember, the derivative of R with respect to T is minus sine T cos T. So dr is minus sine T cos T dt. So now let's actually put the R into here. There's no harm in doing this, but it's kind of unfilled in. And remember, the Y is sine T and the x is cosine t. So this is the function or the field, sine t plus two cos t comma cos t dotted with minus sine t and cos t. After I do that dot product, then I evaluate with respect to t. When I do that dot product, I get a minus sine squared t minus two sine t cos t, that's the first slot times first slot, but then I add the second slot times second slot, plus cos squared t, dt. And now I integrate from zero to pi. And this is gonna simplify in some ways, I think it's gonna simplify too much, but that's okay, that's life. Because notice that cos t squared 
cos squared t minus sine squared t is the cosine of 2t. And notice that this is sine of 2t. 2 sine t cos t is sine of 2t, but a minus sign in front. But we've already decided that this is going to be a zero. Because remember, the area under cosine 2t, when one period is zero to pi, that net area is zero, and then sine 2t. Now, minus sine 2t is upside down, but just a raw sine 2t with a period of pi, this net area is zero. Well, that was underwhelming. So I think I better go and look what this is. You mean there's no work being done here? You mean that there's no flow of this field? Well, certainly this field has some kind of flow. No, be very careful how you speak this. There's no net flow along that curve. There's no network being done as I move that suitcase along that curve. So let's go and illustrate this. I'm gonna pop over to that same notebook that I was using a second ago. But now, instead of drawing the shower curtain, I'm gonna draw the curve in the plane with the field and the field along the curve. Now, again, I'll tell you what I did with each one of these commands right here, but I had to work at picking a good window, right? So first of all, here's my curve. I'm gonna parametrically plot the curve. Notice I'm doing this in two dimensions. Here, I set these things up in three dimensions to see the shower curtain. But this time I'm gonna show things in two dimensions. The curve, the field itself is the gradient field that I've defined above. And I'm really interested in the field along the curve. So I'm gonna highlight that by plotting that differently than the field itself. So here I'll plot the whole gradient field in the window, but here I'm gonna plot the gradient field, but only on the curve. So when I say vector points table R of T, the table R of T is gonna give me a sampling of points along that curve. Ooh, not a very human friendly sampling of points, but what I have here is 21 points along that curve. Remember Mathematica evaluates things automatically. If I want numerical approximation, I could put a period in there. But that's neither here nor there. This is called the table command to assemble a list of things in this fashion. What I'm gonna do is tell Mathematica to plot this vector field, but only plot it at the points along that curve and give me the legend so I can see the color coding. And then to make this cool, let's do the curve and the field and the field along the curve all at the same time. So with a single press of a button, now this is misleading. It's not a single press of a button because it took me 10 or maybe more minutes to tweak and play with this. You have to understand that that's what you face when you're doing this. I wanted to get you started in chapter six, so I provided this for you for the first couple of exercises. Wow, this is interesting. Now notice a couple of things are happening. I have the field displayed in gray. So that could be the water spilling across this tabletop. And this wire is the half circle. Maybe it's just a line that I drew on the tabletop, or maybe it's a very thin wire. But you see the arrows spilling across this wire. If the field is too distracting, let me remove the field for a moment. You see the arrows spilling across this wire. Now the problem is I think I'm gonna make this larger, but larger on my screen doesn't mean larger on your screen. So notice that sometimes the fields have different magnitude, the field vectors have different magnitude. The magnitudes are ranging from small 0 0.5 to larger nearly 2.5 in the light yellow regions. But making this larger on my tabletop does not necessarily make it larger on yours. That's why I'm trying to look at what you see, but it's not bad. Now, 
let's imagine me driving my boat along this curve in this direction counterclockwise. Why? Because that's the orientation of the curve. And let's let the uh, arrows be wind or water. At the front of the curve, the arrows are not, they're kind of crossing my path, right? But some part of that arrow is helping me. So I'm getting positive contributions initially. And then around this space, it looks like that arrow is probably perpendicular to my path. It's not helping me at all, the wind or the water. But now I see the field fighting me. These arrows, the wind is in my face. The water, the flow of the current is against the path of my boat. Although the current is slowing down, getting darker. Here, the current is directly in the path against my motion. But then as I round this corner up here, now the field is flowing with me. The wind is in my back, so to speak, and I'm being aided as I travel along this curve. And then the field picks up in strength. By the time it gets back to here, it's relatively strong compared to this portion up here around 120 degrees. So is the flow of this field along this curve zero? No, the net flow of this field along this curve is zero. Let me do this without the field along the curve so you can try to visualize that. There's the whole field that the curve exists in. And then let me add the part for the field along the curve. Although, you know, you decide what's too busy for you. Maybe you just want to show the field. Maybe you want to show the whole field. I showed you this field in the background. Notice how I did that. By taking out the color of the field. I didn't want it colored by magnitude. And then by imposing my own color on the field, I chose light gray. Okay, you could choose any color you like. I think green would be a little bit silly. Yeah, that makes this hard to read. So let's go back to light gray. There's a list in Mathematica's documentation of the colors that are available to you. Okay, very excellent. Now, I want to point out right now that we're working inside of section 6.2. So if I stop this sharing and go back to my web page, I'm looking at your assignments for week 12. First, for Thursday, I just want you to play with fields in section 6.1. So if you like, you can uh, draw fields in Mathematica. You can look at the questions and see how they want you to answer them. Yes. But this calculation that I just did technically is from 6.2. And there's the problem 80 alt. So in 80 alt, I give you another field, another curve, and I want you to do the calculations and create the visuals for this. Now we're coming up against our time. So I want to say one more thing as I work here. Let me number this paper. What we just did is a flow calculation, right? You are then naturally gonna say, well, how do I do a flex calculation? And it's not different except for one thing. That we're going to modify our use of the unit normal for reasons that will become apparent later. Remember, unit normal, when I talked about a path of space, was the direction I was turning. And that was a good choice of the definition because it made the unit normal specific to my path. It was a path independent. It was a self-contained frame of reference. We called it the Frenet frame. But here, I'm going to make unit normal something else that's related but not the same. So here's two examples of curves. And I start and stop on the curve. 
So I'm just warning you about a calculation we're going to do next time. And so I have a direction that I travel on this curve. But here in unit normal, in two-dimensional path, will always be pointing to the right as I travel the curve in this direction. So that gives me my unit tangent vector and my unit normal vector. And that's the way we experienced it when we first talked about curves in the plane. Oh, I'm sorry, I want to go back to my paper formally. So I'll go back to recording on my paper. The n unit normal is pointing to the right. That makes sense. But here, I also want the unit normal to point to the right. So as I'm driving down this road, I want to keep the unit normal on my right-hand side. This is how we're going to obey the right-hand rule in this context. So this is against the convention that we used earlier. So let's be sensitive to that. I'll show you how to deal with that. So here's my unit tangent vector on this curve. And my unit normal is always pointed to the right. Now, if the unit tangent vector is v of t mag v of t, so if my curve is x of t y of t, then I can make this n, this unit normal vector here, just by saying, well, let's make the x portion of t be the y portion opposite. Let's let the y portion of t be the x portion of n. In other words, I want to say this carefully. The x portion of t becomes what? Oppositely directed, the y portion of n. The y portion of t becomes the x portion of n. So look at it like this. y of t minus x of t. This is naturally perpendicular to R. So I'm going to let N be that derivative of X and Y, but the derivative of Y and minus X. And this is described and drawn more carefully for you in your book. I want to point you to the book page where he did this just so, and you can see this written. And he makes this statement on uh, theorem 6.6 .6 in section 6.2. See the presentation, theorem 6.6, .6, section. 6.2. So as a consequence of this, if you do this to be your normal vector, and then you take the unit normal to be that over mag that, notice the magnitude of this is the same as the magnitude of V. So then you get F dot N dS, you get the same canceling out. I think we're gonna have to demonstrate this next time. And so you frequently see this written as f dot n. Because you get these magnitudes cancel out right here. I think I'm going to write that more carefully next time. One more warning, because the book is very loose with the notation in these sections. In fact, it's not loose with the notation. It's just very, very bad proofreading in the book. So we've talked about 
f.tds. Now there's also notation, a little circle on it, f.tds. And in the old days, the circle had a counterclockwise arrow on it. This is called flow. This legally is called circulation, which means flow on a closed curve when the starting and stopping place is the same point. Then the flow is called circulation. If your curve does not start and stop at the same point, then it's silly to write a circle here. But I think there's very bad proofreading in this section. You often see them using both of these notations interchangeably without caring whether this C is a closed curve or not. So be very careful. Do not use the circle notation unless you're talking about a closed curve. And if the book does use it, when it's not talking about a closed curve, you ignore it. This is what we're doing right now. We will do the circle notation later because it does have meaning. And as I said, in the old days, we even specified counterclockwise circulation. We will need to do counterclockwise circulation. But nowadays people just write the circle and assume you know it's counterclockwise. Okay. I just had to give you that extra warning in case you're trying to read what's in the book. I am going to get these notes posted and get this video posted and you're wrapping up your exam. You can send me questions while you're wrapping up the exam. But what I'm gonna do right now is pop out of here and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I do have online Zoom meeting office hours, which I'll get into right now. I got to transition out of here. But if you do want to ask a question, you can pop over to those hours, office hours. Follow the office hours link. I don't mean to cut you off right here. I will see you later.